tell me to do and give this sermon. Unpracticed, unread, well, how it's going to go by the name of Jesus, I think the message is significant. And given the time we have, I have to consider that too. I know we've been busy worshiping and having a good time today, so hallelujah. Um, so praise the Lord. Um, the more we're divided, the less powerful we become. Uh, we're not going to be anything to take that down. It's not going to be anything like that today. Um, have you ever noticed that, that, that in our lives that, that situations try to divide us from our loved ones? They try to divide us from, from our church. They try to divide us from, from, from a, a job we know that's good. I've seen people leave good jobs. For no reason, they have a reason. Something divided them from that job. You know, uh, happy all of a sudden, and all of a sudden, just disgruntled, you know? And usually what, what causes it is the root of division is pride. Okay? And we need to be careful with that. We need to understand that, 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 that the more we're divided, the less powerful that we are together, right? And that's where Satan wants us. You see, your success at any level brings opportunity for envy, doesn't it? If you're if you're something's going good in your life, you, you got that breakthrough, uh, someone you love is clean and sober, you got your home, you finally got a car, I mean, it, whatever it may be, your your child graduated, just whatever accomplishments you may have, you got a job that you're wanting, uh, you're finally able to retire, I mean, any any of these things. You know, so you're successful, but guess what? It's that envy. Someone's going to have envy, and someone's not going to be happy for you. Is that okay? Let's find out if that's okay or not. Let's talk about Jesus. First thing I want to do is I'm going to read. I'm going to read, give me a minute to look this up here. I'm going to go to Matthew chapter 6, 1 through 7. See how fast I can look something up. There we are. Did I beat Google? Yeah. <laughs> that was weird. Really All right, you don't have to look it up if you want. I'm just kidding. I'm going to read it out of the, 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 the. Sometimes it's better if you just listen because I'm reading really probably. I'm reading out of the NLT, your version is probably different, it'll just confuse you. But you can verify it uh, later on. Yeah, wait a minute here. I'm on the wrong. Oh, Mark 6, 1 through 7. Sorry about that. Talk about Jesus. We're going to talk about. There we are. I guess I didn't beat Google. Praise <laughs> the Lord. Jesus rejected at Nazareth. Have you ever felt rejected? Have you ever been rejected by your own people? By people that should be grateful? That you would think they'd be on your side, but they reject you? They ignore you when all you're trying to do is the right thing? Or you are doing the right thing. Not even trying. You're past the trial. You're there. Well, don't feel alone. Because there was one greater than us that was rejected by his own people. What a tragedy it was for them, what they missed. Can you imagine? You know how good it is to come home and all you want to do and the gifts you want to bring and how you want to come to the house like Jesus didn't go back to his hometown. He's like, you know what? I've been baptized. I got the Holy Spirit on me. The healing is there. I'm going to go home and bring this to my own people. Thank you, Father. What an honor. What he must have felt like knowing that the hand of God was on his life. That when, when he come up out of the water, when John the Baptist baptized him, the Holy Spirit sent him on him. You see that? He knew. He, he knew who he was. He had healed many, and he knew that God was with him. And now it's time to go to Nazareth and bless his own people. Look up his friends, his neighbors, and heal them. And uh, just, he just knows in his heart he's going to lead them, correct? But they're, they're going to be receptive. But guess what? They were not receptive. Jesus left that part of the country and returned with his disciples to Nazareth, his hometown. The next Sabbath, 
He began teaching in the synagogue, and many who heard them were amazed. They asked, where did you get all this wisdom and power to perform such miracles? Then they scoffed at him. He's just a carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James and Joseph, Judas, and Simon, and his sister lived right here among us. They were deeply offended and refused to believe in him. Do you know what being scoffed at means? Do you know what scoff means? It was made fun of. They made fun of him. He's trying to help them and heal them, and they're making fun of him. Then Jesus told them the prophet is honored everywhere except in his own hometown among his relatives and his own family. Sound familiar? And because of their unbelief, he couldn't do any miracles among them except to place his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Amazed. They're watching people get healed and he's laying hands on, but they're still making fun of him. They wouldn't believe in him. They wouldn't accept who he was. But Jesus has a little trick for them. Then it goes on to say in verse 7, in verse on down here goes, 6, Then Jesus went from the village to village teaching people, and he called his, his 12 disciples together and began sending them out two by two. And we'll leave it at that. He's a lot brighter than uh, we give him credit. I'm going to explain what I realized this morning when I was going over that. You see, a prophet wasn't welcome in his own country. Excuse me, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Whatever the people knew in his hometown stopped them from being healed, didn't it? They knew him. They grew up with this man. They knew Jesus Christ. They watched him as a little boy. They knew his dad, knew his mom, knew his whole family. They knew him, right? He made that no mystery, they knew him. It didn't stop him, it stopped them. You see this? When people accept you as you were and not as you are, it's not stopping you, it's stopping them. You see that? Don't let it stop you, because they're the ones getting stopped by the blessing. You're not coming to bring harm, you're coming to bring prosperity, blessings, and healing in a way that's better than they know in their life. So don't be stopped by them. Jesus was not stopped. They were stopped from their blessings. Do you get you catch on to that? Remember, he grew up with them. They, they defined him as only someone they knew, not someone they should know. Correct? They define you sometimes as someone they knew, not someone they should know now to knew you, right? They saw the carpenter, not the creator. You see? What they see you, they see the, 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 the person that probably lost in different ways and doing different things. Who knows? Who knows? Maybe you never did nothing wrong. The only thing you ever did wrong was you didn't fulfill your life quick as you should have just bowed to the Lord Jesus like so many people. But irregardless, they don't realize who you are and they didn't realize who he was. They thought that he was good enough to fix their house, but he wasn't good enough to fix their lives. Right? That's what they were saying. He's a carpenter. They give him credit for being a carpenter, but they were not going to give him credit for being a creator. But isn't a carpenter kind of a creator? Right? Take a bunch of sticks and turn them into something that they're beautiful. Does anyone here ever feel that way? Oh God, I ask you to Restore my home, but you aren't big enough to restore my life. Right? Think about that. Oh, God, please come restore my home, but I have this problem that I know you can't help, so I'm just going to keep it. What are we doing? We're doing the same thing they did, aren't we? He's good enough to be a carpenter, but he's not good enough to be our creator, right? He's not good enough to create a new life in us. To get rid of the old and to bring in the new. You see, isn't that, isn't that what we're saying? Isn't that how it works? He's not good enough to heal me, but he's good enough to heal somebody else. He can fix my house. He can help my children. He can help me pay this bill. He can bless me with a car, but he can't heal me. Do you see? I ask you 
you to restore my child, but I don't believe that you have the power to heal my life, to change what I need to change, to overcome what I need to change. You're a great carpenter, but you're not going to be my God. Do you see the difference? Do you ever feel that way? Do you ever, is that the way how it goes sometimes? I've been guilty of that. Pray for my children, but then I don't pray for me. Why? Because I'm looking at a carpenter, right? That's what's happening at the time, right? If I if I was wise, I would and I would and I never and I was living my life as I should in my thoughts and my mind, I would realize that he's my creator. And I'd be praying for me. Does anyone ever not pray for their self? And they pray for someone else? That's what's happening. You see that? You make him a carpenter, not a creator. You're leaving out of the most important part of everything. He came for you. What he does with you is after you realize he's the creator. After you accept him as your healer. After you accept him in all powers and positions of your life. That he can do anything. That is when he's going to use you. And I'm going to show you why he did what he did. And you're going to understand what God explained to me today. Mark 6, 3 says that Jesus' own people were offended by his wisdom and miracles. Right in the word of God, it says they were offended. Offended by his miracles. Would you be offended by his miracles? They were. But when we look at him as just a carpenter, we become offended by his miracles, right? It's automatic. We're like, our life's too personal. Jesus, I don't want you in that part. I'll deal with my Bible. That's what we're doing. We're saying, I'm offended of your son, God. In life, sometimes we go out of our way to make people like us. You ever been trying to make someone like you? It's a tough job. We suffer personal turmoil in trying to figure out why they don't like and listen to us. Listen. You don't have to do anything wrong for people not to like you. It just happens, okay? Just because someone does not like you mean you did. Did Jesus do anything wrong? They didn't like him, did they? Jesus came to save, heal, bless, and prosper. And he has plenty who don't like him. But he didn't let them live his life. He let the Father live his life. Do you understand that? You see, a prophet wasn't welcome in his own country. So Jesus put his spirit on us. This is this is this. Put his spirit on us so we could put it on them. He put it on his disciples so they could put it on, on the people that would listen to him. Because this way, they don't recognize the giver until after they know him through us. Do you understand that? So, some people are offended by Christ. But guess what? Christ put his spirit on us. I don't believe in Jesus. But you know what they might believe in? Is they might believe in you. And through you, they can believe in Jesus. You see, Christ was smart enough to know that the people that didn't like him didn't have to know him. You understand that? They can meet him later through the other people. So he sent them out. And guess where they went? Right back to Nazareth. Do you see? But they accepted them and they didn't accept Christ. Do you see the difference? We are the people he's sending out. That is us. That is why we must trust our Creator so that he can use us and reach these people that don't accept him already. You see, a lot of people, most people I think heard about Jesus Christ just like they have McDonald's, correct? Some people may not like McDonald's. I don't like that. But you get them one of them big red sandwiches when they're hungry and bring it to them and see what's happening. All of a sudden, they might not, I don't remember being that good. You get it? You understand who we are and why we are?
So see, you don't have to worry about people liking you. You don't have to make anybody like you. You let Jesus live in you and God will do the rest. Sometimes people judge us and say, look at him, he thinks he's really something or he, she thinks she's really something. You ever been around that before? You heard that? God says that you are something. You are really something. So what's wrong with claiming who you are in Jesus Christ? I do think I'm something. I'm a child of the Most High. In the name of Jesus, I am somebody. I am a dignitary of God Almighty. Yes, I'm something. Thank you for noticing. So what's wrong with claiming who you are in Jesus Christ? Claim it. Say, I claim it. I claim it, everybody. I claim it. Everybody say, I am something. I am something. Everybody say, I am more than you see. I don't believe. I was chosen by God to be something in the name of Jesus. Let me hear that. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. And that's who we are. You see, you are a dignitary of Jesus Christ, the King of Kings. Do you know how valuable a dignitary is of a king? Why, well, I man, we've got special tags for the United States. They have palaces over here built for them. They come with the royal treatment. They can't even get a speeding ticket. They're so valuable. What do you think you're worth as a dignitary of the king of kings? You are. I say, I am a dignitary of the king of kings. I'm a of the king of kings. Hallelujah. And that's who we are. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let me tell you something else you don't know. Well, you might know, but you're going to find out anyway if you don't know. It's to discover your purpose is to lose your home. Like what? Lose my home? To discover your purpose in God is to lose your home. I'm going to explain why. The moment that you find out who you are is to discover that you don't fit in in all the places you used to fit in. Right? Is that correct? You don't fit in in the bar scene all of a sudden when you, when you belong to Jesus Christ, do you? You don't fit in in the drug dens. All those things don't fit anymore. So guess what? That home you knew, home is where you feel you belong. You understand that? All those places you used to belong to, you no longer belong to. So home is not there. Home is heavenly. You cannot have a purpose without displacement. Do you understand that? The word itself, purpose, means to be driven in a direction towards a place of completion. You see, so if you have a purpose, the one thing is for sure, if you're being driven anywhere, you're not staying in the same place. You ever try to drive somewhere and stay in the same place? Doesn't work, does it? You are moving and putting distance between you and what was and who was. You understand that? And the who was is all those naysayers in the background that just won't accept who you are because they liked who you was because who you was may get feel better about who they are. And heading towards what is and what will be your future. That's, what we're, that's our purpose. That's what we're driving for. When you get in the car with Jesus, you leave behind the people from your hometown that become offended by your new walk and your new talk and your new prosperity and the life of joy and happiness. Yes, leave behind your home. It is time to say, I will leave behind my home in the name of Jesus. Say, I will leave behind my home in the name of Jesus. Because with Jesus, I have a purpose. With Jesus, I am the purpose. Hallelujah. But guess what? Your new home isn't your old home anymore. And thank God my new home is not my old home. I tell you that for sure. Thank you, Jesus. What a horrible home I had. I thought I had a great home. 
I used to have a home in the country. I had some acreage around it, beautiful, nice home. Doctors living next door to me. Oh, I thought I was home. That's where I belonged. I was in hell. Okay? I wasn't, I didn't have a home of joy. I had a home of corruption. I had a home of, of look at me, a home of, of self-dignity and pride. It didn't mean anything. And guess what? And guess what the devil did? About the time I thought I had it all, he took it all and cursed me with a drug habit. Do you understand that? That's what the devil did. And I'm going to tell you something. God Almighty will give you more with the little than the devil will ever give you in a lot. What little bit he gives you will go so much further than all the devil can give you. God can give you one word that will change your life more than your whole life of self-seeking can ever gain you in the world of Satan. It's time to live Jesus, not people. It's time to get up. It's time to get behind us the, 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 the demons that are snapping at our ankles, that are trying to take us down, that are trying to take our little children out of the schools, that are trying to hurt us, that are trying to corrupt our families' minds. It's time to say, Jesus, I am ready to give up me for you. It's time to realize he's more than just a carpenter. It's time to accept him as Kudo number one, the creator. That's what time it is. It's time to give up everything, every apprehension we have and say, God, you are big enough to help me. You are big enough to change what I need to change. It is that time in our lives. We are the purpose of God. Do you know that? We are the purpose. We are the dignitaries of God. He came so we could. Before him, there was no way. You had to go to some, to some, some priest that was, that, was, that was greedy and evil and ask him to get you to God. How's the devil going to get you there? Christ came as our ultimate priest, the high priest of priests, the shells of death, the king of kings, the we his dignitaries. And with that becomes a great responsibility. We must be willing to stand up for him. We must be willing to take it and, and take our purpose and take it to other people and tell people. No matter if they don't want to hear it or not, believe me, our home is not what our home was. We had to move and we accept Jesus Christ. One time, sometimes I've seen people have to quit a job just because they knew the devil had a hold on them. You understand? They had to quit a job just so they could they could change your direction. If it's cost you you your salvation, you need to evaluate it. Maybe it's you you're trying instead of letting God have it. Don't, let, don't try to solve your own problems. Give God your problems first. Let Him work them out. They'll get much better. Like I said, it's time to live Jesus, not people, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Say hallelujah. hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. I am a dignitary of God Almighty. Say that. I am a dignitary of God Almighty. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. I want to, at this time, it's, I know this is a short message, but it's just a message that I know the Lord wanted me to give. And, and, and believe me, God has a grand plan for everybody in here. Your children, he's got, he's got so many great things for all of us that we can't even comprehend. Just what this carpenter, the, the carpenter creator could do in our lives. Let him do it. Let, let him not only build our homes, let him build us personally. In the name of Jesus, let us pray. Father God in heaven, we come to you and we thank you so much for all you've done. We thank you for the power and the glory that you give us. We thank you for everybody in here. Father God, we put up a lot of petitions and a lot of prayers and a lot of prayers of protection for our children. Father God, we still put those up. Father God, we ask your Holy Spirit to go ahead of us and to protect our children, protect our homes, protect us. Father God, we receive you as a people into our hearts and into our lives. In the deepest, darkest areas of our life, Father God, we want you to come in there and heal us. We want healing from you, Father God, and we claim victory in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you all so much.